church, I want to welcome you to worship this morning as we give thanks to our Father for giving us this day to come together in the name of Jesus and lift up His name and let His Spirit fill our hearts that He might be glorified in our time together this morning. I, I want to encourage you to stand with me and let's offer up a prayer as we pause and remember that it's by grace that we stand. Amen. It's by His mercy that we can come before Him and be received just as a child comes before its father. And his father's willing to pick him up in His arms and love him. Let's hold that image in our hearts this morning because it's the image He would have us hold of Him, our good Father. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks because you are with us. We give you thanks because you call us to lives that put our faith and our trust in you. Lives that go beyond what we can see. Lord, that give us something solid to stand on that we can only embrace through faith. We thank you for that opportunity, Lord. And as we worship you this morning, we pray that you would be glorified as we turn our hearts towards you in love and adoration. You're worthy, Lord. We praise you. Hear this now, Lord, our song of ascent.
No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the can be seated. Good morning. Oh, it is good to be. Come on, bro. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Church at the Lake. Uh, we have combined this 9 o'clock service with the 945 uh, service on campus, so uh, we're going to do that until further notice, so just please watch, pay attention, and, and uh, uh, if the weather prohibits us from being here, then we will be at the main campus inside, but it'll be at 9 o'clock, not at 945. So please, please remember that because uh, that's when we'll be going over there. Um, check out our website at gfumc.net for news and like what's going on in the life of the church. There's a lot uh, posted there and, and you can keep up and follow there. Um, also, um, everyone with us by live stream, um, you can easily... And you can quickly uh, sign in with an online attendance card. Uh, we love to know that you're here. Uh, we love to know that you're with us. So please do that. That, that way we'll that way we'll know you're with us. Thank you for doing that. Um, what? Who would have thought we would have got weather like this on uh, Labor Day weekend? Uh, isn't it great out here? And you know what else today is? You, you see Brad sitting at the, side, at the sound table there? Today's Brad's birthday. Yeah. Brad, happy birthday, Brad. Man, we appreciate you and we love you. <laughs> Ushers, can you come, please? They're going to just make their way down and probably make their way around, um, and we're going to pray together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the one true God of creation, we bless you this morning together. And we are enjoying your creation outside this morning. And Father, we give you thanks. May we be good stewards, good obedient stewards of your creation. And we confess to you this morning that, that we have this bent to not obey. To not obey your instructions. And Father, thank you. Thank you for not leaving us to wonder, for not leaving us to, to guess how you want us to live or what you expect from us. But thank you, Father. Thank you for giving us instructions for living that leads to life. Father, we pray this in your obedient son's name. Amen. Show. 
as the Spirit leads your heart into worship. Embrace all of the things that God has given us this morning. To truly connect with what He would have us hear. To truly see what He would have us to see. It's a challenge. It's always a challenge. still small voice of God is here and we'll hear it and he's walking amongst us if we'll see him and he's worth building on amen and I will
You know, as I was uh, praying about worship this morning, the Spirit impressed upon me the words of, a, of an old hymn that is so blessed. As a matter of fact, namely, this hymn happens to be Tracy's favorite of all the hymns. It's called, uh, have you guys ever heard Trust and Obey? The old hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's the chorus. But the first verse says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and he abides with all who will trust and obey. This morning, I want us to consider it as we worship, church, as we worship together in spirit and in truth. Let's consider the fact that our Lord Jesus, if you read throughout the Gospels, if you read all throughout the Gospels, you'll see many prevailing themes. But one of the most prevailing themes that you'll see is that our Lord intends for us to operate just one notch above inadequacy. Hear that again. Our Lord always intended for us as believers and as a church to operate just one notch above inadequacy. In other words, whatever we do must be done in His power and not our own. Amen? That, Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. And I can't even walk unless you're holding my hand. That's the idea. That's what makes the gospel the good news. Amen? That's what makes the gospel the good news. Is that it has to be something beyond what Steve can do. In fact, I hope it is. Just like it had to be something other than what Peter could do when he stepped out of that boat on the water. And for a moment, he was able to walk on it just as our Lord did. Josh is going to be speaking to us about that this morning, that what Shane said, we're bent, man, we're bent on not obeying. It's our nature to not obey. And so as we hear the call of the Lord, as we incline our ear, as we lean our heart, as we open up our minds, 
as we set our will to seek God's will for this time and what he would have us hear. And then beyond this time, what he would have us do as we leave here this morning. Let's sing this song fresh. We know it. We know this song, most of us. Let it, let it be our call to worship our prayer as the Spirit prepares our hearts to receive the good news that we can walk on water if we'll trust.
is so um, fitting, right? Like the weather is amazing and beautiful and wonderful, but the story this morning that we have in the Gospel of Matthew, it was not very beautiful and wonderful that day. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read the story of the disciples going out to a place that Jesus told them to go. And Jesus says, I'm going to meet you there later. So Jesus goes up to a mountain to pray, and the disciples go out on a boat. They get on this boat, and storming, and it's insane. Can you imagine? We've got a big body of water right now, but... Can you imagine being out in the lake? I know many of you have probably have been when a storm just comes out of nowhere and you're racing to get back to where you're, where you're supposed to be or some place of safety. Lightning's going off. Nobody likes to be outside when lightning is happening. It's not, it's not very fun. I'm going to take these off. You can see my eyeballs. I'm serious. Um, it's lightning, the storm, and it's, it's getting crazy. They're terrified. They're afraid for their lives. And Jesus doesn't make it any better here. Jesus comes through the water, creeping up, okay? Jesus comes creeping up out of this this darkness. Jesus comes creeping up on the water and says, Hey, somebody come out here. This is paraphrase, okay? Don't don't take this for real. But somebody come out here. Anyways. But Peter looks at Jesus and says, Lord, if it's you, because they thought he was a ghost. They thought Jesus was a ghost. And he says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat. Stop right there. You're looking at somebody. You think they're a ghost. You say, if it's you, come out on the water. Yeah, me, come on. You're just going to believe him anyways. Anyways, it's funny to me. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, I thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place right now. God, in this, in this group of, of people, Lord, that you call the body of Christ, that you call the church. And I thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to listen to your word and to worship, to give you praise and thanks because you are worthy of it. And Lord, I pray as we dive into this scripture, as we dive into the words that you are speaking to us right now, I pray you would open our hearts, open our minds, let our hearts be softened and not hard so that we can hear your word and live your word out the way you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, Jesus did a lot of interesting things throughout his ministry. One of the things that Jesus was constantly doing was calling on people to follow him. Interestingly enough, they did. For the most part, people followed him. Some for a short while, some for a long time. Crowds, masses following Jesus. They listened to this guy because he was doing miracles. He was doing amazing things. And he taught with authority. He was this messenger. Some thought he might be the Messiah. Some thought he might be a prophet, resurrected. Some looked at him and said, he's just a great teacher. But there was something that Jesus had that people wanted, so they followed him. They listened to him. They obeyed. Obedience is, is, is a tough word. It's a, it's a word that today you don't really associate as, as a positive word, you know, obey your parents maybe, but uh, I, was, I was talking to Dean about this, and it's just funny to me because if you got on like eHarmony or Match, like that's not going to be one of your characteristics that you put on there, like the, one of my great qualities is obedience, you know, nobody does that, nobody's going to say, you know, it's like I'm strong and adventurous, or I'm stable and reliable, like you're not going to say I'm obedient, like that's ridiculous, but it's, it's one of the most enduring qualities of Christians, is obedience. It's not just what we do with our dogs. This morning, my dog about took my legs out from under me. She was not being very obedient. She never is. But, but the reality is, is that, that obedience school is not for puppies. Obedience school is for us. It's for us as Christians. Now, I'm not talking to everybody else out there in the world that don't proclaim the name of Christ. I'm talking specifically to the people here today. 
This applies to us, and it applies to us right now. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, right now, in this moment, listen. We are called to be obedient. You know how I know this? Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, was obedient. He was obedient. And in and, and the most majestic of ways, Christ, the Son of God, came down to this earth to live in a mortal body. Can you imagine going from heavenly, immortal, eternal body to mortal body to live with us, to live with us, and to deal with us? Gosh, can you get, can you, have you heard the things that we do when we complain? God, can you imagine being around Jesus when people complain? Jesus, the Son of God, and people are complaining. Listen, God loves you and hears your complaints, and he loves you so much in spite of them. Even you complain when your coffee's just a little, little bit too cold. It's not quite as hot as I like it. But Jesus comes down, and he's obedient, and he humbles himself, even as a servant. Obedience was one of Jesus' most beautiful qualities. Jesus constantly, people would say, wow, Jesus, you did all these miracles. It's amazing, Jesus, how, how amazing you are. And Jesus is like, I'm just being obedient. I'm just doing the work of my Father. My will is his will. And they just kept missing it over and over and over again. Jesus was obedient. He was obedient. He was humble. He was a humble servant. The Son of God was a humble servant. The one that we just sang about was a humble servant, obedient to the will of God. And, of course, obedience is the will of God and for Jesus because that's just who he was. He was perfect and he obeyed God. You see, I would say that obedience is part of our faith journey. Obedience and faith are coincide with one another. In the book of James, it talks about how obedience is part of our faith journey. Because it says faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. We get hung up on that works part. Martin Luther really, really, he, he got people really psyched out about the works part. You know, faith without works is dead. He was like, oh no, those works, though, they won't get you to heaven. But it's not about that. People get so focused on it. Well, it's not about the works. It's about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you right now, that's a lie from Satan. It's all about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But this, the personal relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, that we have, spurs us on to do his work. It's not either or. It's both and. You can't say to yourself that, yeah, I, I just worship Jesus. You know, me and him are just really good friends. And, and we, we, we hang out every once, you know, every once in a while, maybe once, once a week. Jesus wants this, this different faith, this obedient faith. There is not one place in the scripture. There's not one place and throughout all the 2,000 years of Christianity that we know of that where, where, where Christian leaders said, I'm just going to have kind of a um, moderately uh, passive-aggressive relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to kind of follow him here and kind of follow him there. We've never once seen where Jesus said, yeah, you can just kind of follow me when you feel like it. He calls us to be obedient. He calls each and every single one of us to be obedient. It doesn't matter how old you are. How young you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the church. It doesn't matter how long that you've known Christ. And I, and, I, and I know there's people here today that have stepped out and done some amazing things for the kingdom of God. And what I tell those people today is that God's not done with you. And you probably know that. God's not done with you. He doesn't stop. He doesn't stop saying, you did a good job. He's saying, come on, I've got more for you. But there are people here today, and I would say most of us today, I'm throwing myself in this boat too, so you can't get mad at me. The most of us today, our faith is little. It's tiny. It's not big. And I say this because how many of us would have followed Peter out of the boat? You don't have to raise your hands because not many of us would. But how many of us would walk right now if Jesus just showed up right now on this beautiful day? It's not even, not even stormy or windy. And Jesus is standing right out there, and you look at me and say, Is that a ghost? You say, I think that might be Jesus. And Jesus says, come on out. How many of us would follow Peter out on that water? I know that I would. I'd be like, that's a crazy person out there trying to play tricks on me. But Peter trusted in God so much that he stepped out on the water. And we make fun of Peter. I've heard Christians make fun of Peter. I've heard books make fun of Peter. Oh, Peter's little faith. Matthew uses that term a lot. If you'll read throughout the, 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 the book of Matthew, he uses the term little faith quite a lot. 
comes almost like a, he coins the phrase, little faith. But Jesus says, ye of little faith. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if Jesus, the author of creation, says, hey, you've just got a little bit of faith. Because there's another time where he says, if you just had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, that size, I can work with that. When Jesus said that to Peter, when Jesus looked at Peter and said, ye of little faith, he says, I can work with that. Steve put it perfectly just a moment ago. One notch up. One notch up from inadequate. God has our best interest. He's got our best interest in his plans for us. And he doesn't need us to do much. He just needs us to step out and be obedient. See, Peter was obedient. Peter was obedient and he stepped out and started walking. And then he got, whoa, whoa what's going on with this wind? Have you guys, uh, have you guys seen a squirrel run across the street in front of you? And we, we live in the South, obviously, right? So a squirrel, a lot of times what a squirrel will do when they start running across the street and they see a car or, or, or a person or a dog, what does the squirrel do? They like to turn around and go back the other way. That's why there's a lot of dead ones on the road. It's because they run and they're like, oh, they're like 75% of the way there. And then they stop. And they're like, oh, danger. I've got to get back to where I remember it being safe. See, this is something Peter could, could have done. From all we know, Peter could have gone out there in the water, stepped out and started sinking and said, nope, I've got to get back to the boat. I've got to get back to the boat. And probably would have drowned at that point. But Peter, unlike the squirrels that run across the street, Peter looked at Jesus and said, Lord, save me. It was a recognition in that moment that his only hope was Jesus in front of him. And I would wonder today, I would wonder today, is Jesus your only hope? Is Jesus the only one that can save you? Or do you have a lot of comfort, walls, you know, just a, a lot of plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, uh, all the alphabet. Do you have enough walls before you actually have to lean on Jesus? Dude, I think the reason why we can't be obedient, I think the reason why a hard time that we have with being obedient is that we, we don't really know how much God loves us. That our relationship with God is tiny. And he wants so much more. He wants so much more for us. God wants so much more for us. Peter that day called out on Jesus. I want you to listen to this. And we, and this is something, they, they walked with Jesus. They saw the miracles that he had done. And Jesus that day did something just amazing. He walked on water. He called one of his disciples out. And Jesus and he saved Peter, and they got on the boat, and they're like, surely you are the Son of God. This is the Son of God. They proclaimed it. In that moment, this is, this is not a Messiah. This is not a messenger. This is not just some prophet. The guy that we're following is the Son of God. This is it. They made that statement. The funny situation of why this, is, is, why this makes such a, such a, it's just this impression on me, is that just moments before this, in the passages, Jesus had fed 5,000 people. He provided for 5,000 people. The disciples were concerned about their bellies and everybody else's bellies. And Jesus provides for 5,000 people. They'll go out, go out on the water. There's other stories in between. So don't. you need to go read this. It's a story. The way these stories line up, it, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. But it, it, it makes sense for us. Let's listen. Follow me along. So Jesus... Feeds 5,000. The disciples see this amazing miracle. And then he does all these miracles. He's healing people. And then he goes out in the water. And they're like, oh, you are the son of God. And then the Pharisees come and question him. And then they're like, hey, Jesus, we've got 4,000 people now. And they're really hungry. Uh, we don't know what we're going to do. And Jesus is like, what? I fed 5,000. I healed people. I walked on water. You called me the son of God. And now you're questioning whether or not I can feed 4,000. How many times have we looked at God and he's done amazing things in our lives. And then the very next day we look back and we go, God, I just don't know if you can do this. I don't know if you can handle this, God. I don't even know if you want to handle this, God. Maybe that's what they were questioning. Maybe the disciples were so insecure. Maybe they really didn't think that Jesus really cared about them that much. So they tiptoed up to him and they said, Jesus, we got 4,000 people. Can you feed them? And Jesus is like, of course I will. 
Don't you see what I've been doing? Don't you see? Have you not walked with me? Can you not see me? See, they were too focused on the things that Jesus was doing to really see how much he loved them. And so not even long after that, right after this situation, the disciples look at Jesus. They go over to the other side. And they go to Jesus and say, hey, oh no, Jesus. We know that you just fed 5,000. We know that you just healed all those people. We know you just set the Pharisees and the Sadducees in their place. We know that you just walked on water and did all kinds of crazy stuff. We know that you just fed 4,000 people. Hey, but we left the bread. We left the bread at home. Um, and we're hungry. What are we going to do? Oh, no. This is literally what happens. This is literally the story that happens. And you look and you say, this is ridiculous. Disciples, what, what are they even, why are they asking Jesus for food? And Jesus looks at them and says, and he teaches them, and he says, listen, it's not about food. It's not, are you, have you not been getting it? I love you. You don't need to worry about these things. Don't be distracted by the world. Just come and follow me. You see, the reason why a lot of times the disciples were so confused about what Jesus was doing, a reason why that in and, and the moment of his, his crucifixion they ran away and hid is because their relationship with God was still very, very shallow. And if the relationship that they had with Jesus, the one they spent three years with, that they follow with, that they'd follow out on the water, that they'd follow all these different places, to see him do all these miracles, if their relationship was shallow, I wonder where our relationships are today. If I can look at Peter, even as, as, as we call Thomas Downing Thomas, who, who, who told Jesus, hey, Jesus, he was one of the only disciples. I think he was the only disciple to say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I heard that you said you're going to go die. Um, I'll follow you there. I'll go. I'll follow you and, and die with you. How much of us, how, if, if their faith was shallow in those moments, if their faith was little when they followed Jesus out onto the water, I wonder where our faith is today. Listen, I'm not accusing anybody of anything this morning. I'm just saying what the Holy Spirit led me to do. I left my notes in Franklin, Tennessee, and that wasn't by accident. The Lord said, you need to lean on me this morning, Josh. You don't need to try to be non-offensive, whatever that word. You, don't, don't, you, you, need, to, you need to listen to the Spirit because the Spirit offends us. The Spirit is offensive. Jesus Christ is the rock that people stumble on. How many times have I stumbled when I've read the word of, oh, that hurt. This morning, God is calling you to obedience. And I would ask you this question this morning. What is preventing you from obeying God and stepping out into the water? And stepping out. Because in that, in, that, in that same song that we just sang just a moment ago, it's, you call me out upon the waters. I've seen you do these things before. You've always done these things. Why in the world do we look back on what God has done and we say, how amazing is it that God has done these things? And then we look forward and we say, he can't do them in this situation. Why do we let the enemy attack us? And I would say that our relationship with our Father in heaven is shallow. Church, this is all around the world right now. I've seen it. The church's relationship with our Father in heaven is shallow, and God wants more. He wants more for us. He wants so much more for us. Revival is happening whether we like it or not. God's will is going to be done whether we like it or not. The question is, do you want to be a part of it? 2,000 years, the church did exactly what the Hebrews did in the Old Testament, up and down, up and down. So we call them great awakenings. People woke up and they said, I need to follow. I need to give it up and follow. What is it that you need to give up this morning? What's preventing you from really embracing your relationship with God? Peter gave it up. He gave up his shame, his guilt. He gave, up, he gave it all up. He gave up his anger. He stood up at the day of Pentecost, empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he stood up there, and he called people out, and he said, I'm going to offend you today. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus, and you are sinners. But guess what? Good news is he loves you. Peter got up in boldness. He didn't care about his popularity. He didn't care who he was going to offend. He didn't care if he was even going to die that day. He got up there, and he shared the good news. 
obedient faith. He trusted in God because he knew who God was, and he knew who God was, and because he knew that God loved him, he knew all of who God was in that moment. He said, I love you, God, and I know that you love me, so that informs my identity, that informs who I am, that I am a son of God, that I am a child of God, so that means I have nothing to worry about. I'm not worried about what's around the corner because you've already been there, God. You're already there. You're there, and you're there, and you're here, and so Peter stood up that day because he finally clicked in his head. And it didn't mean it stopped because Peter kept growing. But in that moment, Peter's faith, boom, it blossomed. It blew up. And he said, I know who my father is in heaven. And he loves me. And he doesn't want anything bad for me. There may be chaos around me. There may be chaos around me. But the peace and the joy and the happiness and the love and the abundance of patience and kindness, all these good things are way better than anything that's around me. So Peter stood up, and he shared the good news with thousands of people, and thousands of people that day came to, came to know Christ. Where are you today? Are you sitting back in that boat? Are you sitting back in that boat, just observing the faithful? Are you just sitting back in that boat saying, wow, that is the Son, son of God over there? Have you stepped out, still a little afraid, still a little cautious because you don't really know if God is really going to take you there, if God is really going to move you past that point? Are you trying to turn around and get back in the boat? Are you flailing because you don't really know if Jesus will save you? Are you reaching out and crying out, Lord, save me, hold me, God, please, in that desperation? Or are you standing up in the day of Pentecost and you're saying, nothing else matters. I'm going to be obedient. God wants to take you to a place this morning. Beyond where you are, wherever you are this morning, in your faith journey, God wants to take you a step further. He wants to take you further. And listen, if anything tells you in this moment, God wouldn't take me there. Oh, God wouldn't do that he knows that I have a wife and kids, or he knows that I have a family, or he knows that, that God wouldn't take me there. That's dangerous. God wouldn't, God wouldn't call me to do that. God, that is, that's the enemy. How many times has the enemy attacked people in Scripture as we read? He said, did God really say, God wouldn't take you to those places? God wouldn't do that to you. I'm telling you people, God has so much for us. And man, y'all can go ahead and come up. Riley's already up. See, he's trying to get me to. <laughs> but the Spirit of God is calling us to a place. And I, and I would ask you this morning, are you being obedient? Are you being obedient? Are you, are you saying God, yes? Are you saying God, yes? Do you trust that God loves you this morning? Because man, that's probably the most important thing that I can get across this morning. Is do you trust that God loves you? Do you believe that? And if you don't believe that, I call you right now. Get on your knees and say, Lord, help me believe that you love me. Help me believe that you love me. Because I need it more than anything because you won't get anywhere. You can't be obedient. You can't go where God wants you to go unless you believe that he is your father in heaven. Unless you believe that and you know that. And you can only know that with his help through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning... God calling us to a bigger place. He's calling us to a deeper place. The fact that we're even out here in this moment is pretty cool, right? Like we're in this, this different environment. It's not the church that we grew up in, right? God's calling us to a deeper place. He's calling you to a deeper place. He's calling you to be obedient. And I don't know what it is, but I know for a fact that right now God is speaking to every single one of you because God doesn't shut up. He's loud. And he's been teaching us. And if you're still wondering, well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I'm just not hearing those things. I don't have Holy Spirit hearing aids. Listen, get the word of God. Get the word of I just come up with that. I was good. Get the word of God and read it. I told some youth, my youth group back in Franklin this Wednesday, I told my ninth grade boys, I said, you can read the Gospels 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. You can get in there. You can read every single gospel 15 minutes a day. 
and you can read it in a month, 30 days. It'll take you 30 days for 15 minutes a day. If you want to stand and spend some time in the Word, just 15 minutes a day. Get up in the morning. It's a little bit earlier. Drink your coffee. Read the Word of God. See what He's telling you. I promise you. He's going to reveal things in your life. He's going to teach you things. And He's going to say, come with me. And then it's up to you at that moment to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to pray for us. And then the band's going to lead us in worship. And in this moment, guys, this is not just a moment that ends here. Eternity is now. The Lord is calling us to a deeper place. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, I praise you and I thank you for your spirit that teaches us to say, Abba, Father, your Holy Spirit teaches our hearts to speak the heavenly language of children of God. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would call us to a deeper place. You are calling us to a deeper place, Lord. I pray you'd open our hearts and our minds and our ears to those places. God, you turn up them hearing aids. God, you would turn up everything, Lord. It would be loud, Lord, that we would hear what you're calling us to. You're calling us to a deeper faith, an obedient faith. And it may make no sense, but God, what makes more sense to follow after the one who loves us more than anything? And it may seem right now, God, that, that nothing else, Lord, it, there's chaos all around us. The storm is blowing, and it is insane right now. And it may make sense just to stay in the boat and hunker down, but God, you've called us to a deeper place. You've called us to places, Lord, that if we would just step out, we could see you shining bright. God, he would embolden this church right now in the name of Jesus. That, Lord, we could go out from this place today and share your name with others, God. With our actions, with our words, God. That we could speak loudly and boldly about the, the Son of God who came and died for us and gave us a way back to you. To have a relationship with the everlasting Father, with our Creator. Lord, would you take us from this place right now? Lord, in this moment, that we would not forget because we're going to go eat some wings at the brick, Lord. That we could not forget about this sermon today, Lord, this message that was from you. Lord, that we could step out from this place and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Soften our hearts. Open our minds. And Lord, help us to repent the sin that holds us back. The shame and the guilt and the pain. God, you took care of that at the cross. Just like Peter did, he laid it at the foot of the cross. He said, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. I'm giving it to God because I've got something to tell people. I've got the best news ever. Help us to lay those things at the cross and follow you, God. We love you so much.
covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that, that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and working us all what's pleasing to him through Jesus to whom be glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 